Okay, welcome everybody. Um, USAID's Office of Global Climate Change, uh, where I work on the Sustainable Landscapes team, has for a number of years supported research on land-based climate change mitigation by many of the CGI research centers. And as a package, this work has had impact in a variety of ways. It covers a wide variety of pathways to achieve emission reductions. So we thought it would be useful to bring all this together for people in institutions outside of AID who also have interests in this material. Uh, and that's what this webinar series is designed to do. This is, I think, the fourth in our series. Uh, it has covered so far uh, restoration in Latin America. It has covered lower emissions rice in Vietnam. Uh, today's uh, focuses on research that Todd Rosenstock and colleagues at ICRAF have been doing on agroforestry. Uh, and with that, I'm gonna, so I wanna welcome everybody and turn it over to Todd. Todd, are you there? Yes, we're just waiting for Juliana to bring up the presentation. Today, we will be talking about measurement, reporting, and verification of agroforestry. I'll specifically be talking about lessons learned from a review of current practice that we undertook last year. And my colleagues will be speaking about advances and activities that they've been a part of that align well with the recommendations of that review. Before we go too far into the results of the review, I thought we could start with the fundamentals. What is agroforestry? Agroforestry is the integration of trees with crops and livestock. These trees could be planted, they could be regenerating naturally, or they could be maintained after land use change. It's important to recognize that agroforestry is everywhere. The most iconic and among productive landscapes throughout the world are often agroforestry. Think about the silver pastoral systems that range across Latin America, or the dryland parkland systems that cover West Africa. Because of the great variety of species and management options available to farmers, it should be noted that there's at least hundreds, if not thousands, of permutations of agroforestry systems available. And these different permutations modify climate, water, and nutrient cycles in ways that allow farmers to produce a wide variety of products for their livelihoods and ecosystem services. This means that agroforestry can be a vehicle for sustainable development and climate action. As many of the coffee and drinkers and chocolate eaters in the audience may know, these products are often best suited and best grown in agroforestry systems, suggesting that the use of these high value trees can, and agroforestry is a vehicle for economic development. But agroforestry also produces nitrogen rich fodder that contributes to milk and meat production, provides key vitamins in food, filling nutrient gaps or months when there's little less to eat. And also trees on farm can be a key source of fuel wood and charcoal, reducing pressure on the surrounding landscape. Lastly, by modifying the environment, uh, both the climate, nutrient cycles, and water cycles, agroforestry can deliver a wide range of ecosystem services. In this conversation, we're mostly interested in its ability to store carbon in above and below ground biomass. Uh, but overall, this changes in development and influencing of ecosystem services allows agroforestry to be a mechanism to both adapt and mitigate climate change. In 2017, the UNFCCC decided to move agriculture, the agriculture sector more formally into the negotiations. The resulting Coronivia Joint Work Program crowded of this decision. So agroforestry is not specifically mentioned in the, in the Joint Work Program. It is relevant to at least five of the six key topic areas, as just discussed. And thus, colleagues and I were very interested on in how agroforestry was going to be contributing to climate action. We, we created a program that we call Making Trees Count. We were interested in how trees and agroforestry trees in particular were being represented and accounted for in MRV systems uh, under the UNFCCC. The reason why we we're interested in whether or not trees were agroforestry trees specifically were being counted because if they're not counted, they simply don't count. And what I mean by that 
is that without explicit representation and um, counting within these programs, there will be lesser and diminished incentives to fund and catalyze agroforestry based climate actions, given the other options available. And so we took a approach, a two phased approach to to answering this question about how agroforestry was being measured and reported on under the UNFCCC. The first phase, we did a document review for 147 developing countries. We looked at the nationally determined contributions um, and we explored through both keyword searches as well as reading them cover to cover if countries were planning to use agroforestry. And then we looked at the national communications as well to examine the greenhouse gas inventories of where agroforestry is visible and the methods that were being used to capture it. We followed this document review with a key informant interviews for 12 countries across Asia, Africa, and Latin America. And these countries were selected because they had either a known interest in agroforestry, they had existing agroforestry based actions under development, or they had a number of explicit mentions of agroforestry in the document. You. I'm going to focus on four key lessons that we learned from this, uh, this effort. The first one is that countries plan to use agroforestry for climate action. If we looked at explicit mentions of agroforestry and the nationally determined contributions, the nationally determined contributions being the blueprints for climate actions that countries are putting together under the Paris Agreement, and it, we looked for specific naming of agroforestry, either agroforestry as a term itself or similar types of terms that speak to specific types of agroforestry systems. And if you look at the first bar that on the left, you see that more than 50 countries out of the 147 actually named agroforestry, um, either for mitigation or adaptation. That equals about 40% of the total countries that we looked at. And in some places, in some regions like Africa, nearly 71% of African countries name agroforestry. What this suggests is that agroforestry is, or countries are planning to use agroforestry for climate action in the future. Which brought us, brings us to our second point, which when looking at the national communications, we found that agroforestry, however, is rarely, rarely explicitly represented in greenhouse gas inventories. We, we started our search through the lens of the five principles of MRB put out by the IPCC, which are consistency, transparency, accuracy, comparability, and completeness. But we didn't even get that far because the precondition for to apply those principles is that we could actually see agroforestry in the greenhouse gas inventories. Agroforestry, unlike some land uses, uh, has is Agroforestry has the challenge that it is not a land use as identified either in the IPCC itself, but actually can be found on practically every land use. So the IPCC uses land uses such as grazing lands, crop lands, and settlements, all of which have agroforestry embedded in them, but are not exactly, uh, but are not exact, don't always agroforestry. So when looking at the documents, we saw that 147 countries are, are submitting national communications, 105 of those countries report agricultural forestry and other land uses within those national communications. But only 41 of those countries report subcategories for uh, AFALU emissions, that agricultural forestry and other land use emissions. What this means, it's very hard for readers to know whether or not agroforestry played a role in those calculations or not. This doesn't suggest that agroforestry was not included in those calculations. It just means that it's un we are, were unable, given the information available, to determine with any definitive, uh, in, in a definitive way, that agroforestry had played a role. This could simply be the, an editorial decision on the part of countries not to provide in, enough information because these national communications are simply summaries. But this does suggest a potential opportunity to improve the transparency of these communications if agroforestry is going to be better represented. Our third activity, or our third main lesson that we learned it was that the source of data and the methods used for accounting in AFLU broadly are diverse, but, but are tend to be fairly basic in, for developing countries. 
Greenhouse gas accounting relies on two primary sources of information, activity data and emissions factors. Activity data is, as, as it sounds, areas of land use, the head of cattle, the amount of fertilizer applied. In this case, we're really thinking largely about areas of land use. And emissions factors are sort of carbon stocks per land use or uh, per land use transition, uh, methane per head of cattle, or nitrous oxide per fertilizer applied. And when we looked at the sources of activity data in, in the countries that report AFLU emissions, we see that there's a wide range of different sources that they're reporting. Oftentimes, there's, they do not provide additional information around the methods that were used in these reporting, so where the ministry uh, received their method or where the National Forest Inventory, how did, how did they uh, uh, calculate land use or land air, area of land use, et cetera. But there, it does offer some glimpse that there is both a, that there is a wider range of arrangement of different sources. In addition, when we looked at the emissions factors, we saw that 83% of the countries report using t only tier one emissions factors for agricultural, forestry, and land use. There's three different tiers for emissions factor, ranging from uh, very basic. Uh, which rely on default global values up through uh, more sophisticated and analytically demanding emissions factors in tier three. But only a few of the countries even suggest that they use anything but tier one. So or just 70% report using tier two for any pieces of FLU, not necessarily for agroforestry. This suggests a large opportunity to improve the reporting uh, and accuracy of reporting by moving to higher, higher tiers uh, in the emissions factors and the accounting. We then, in our last lesson, we wanted to highlight some of the results of the interviews. So you can see on the top uh, the various countries that we that we interviewed, and in the left-hand column, the various factors. The colors mean uh, relate to whether or not the representatives that we were talking to either considered this factor an enabler, if it was green, a constraint, if it was orange, or gray, if it was identified or, or named as uh, both a constraint and an enabler uh, at some mm -hmm. point during the interview. And what generally we saw is that there's institutional arrangements and enabling conditions, technical facilities and capacities, and finance all were barriers that prevent including agroforestry uh, MRV. However, of course, there were some issues like sustainable sustained finance or cost for MRV that were always constraints. But we were also buoyed by the fact that there were some issues, including the clear representation of land and the availability of rel locally relevant uh, carbon stock change and emissions factors that were constraints in some countries, but enablers in others, suggesting that there could be a leverage point to, to greatly improve or integrate agroforestry MRV into these greenhouse gas inventories in the future. What this allowed from this work, both the interviews as well as the document review, brought us to the four recommendations we had for moving forward. That was to provide the guidelines for agroforestry reporting, uh, this to imp largely improve the transparency of whether or not agroforestry is or is not included in inventories, a capacity building on identifying and navigating institutional arrangements. Agroforestry often sits between the Ministry of Environment and the Ministries of Agriculture. Uh, provide accessible approaches for representation of lands with agroforestry and develop carbon stock change and emission factor data and databases that are relevant for the specific ways that countries are reporting. Thank you. You can find out more information about this work and any of the briefs or articles or, full, or, or the full report that we put out. Um, these are all downloadable on climate links or through the CCAS and GRA uh, Ag M MRV website. Thank you. Thanks, Juliana. And uh, next up, we're going to have Karis Tennyson. Karis is a senior research scientist with expertise in ecology, statistics, natural resource management, remote sensing, and GIS. Her work for, focuses on developing decision support tools to monitor land use and land cover dynamics, biomass estimation, assessing ecosystem services, and scenario planning. She has also developed various methods and knowledge transfer activities in support of USAID's Silver Carbon Program, including the development of Collect Earth Online. 
She holds an interdisciplinary PhD in urban design and planning from the University of Washington with a specialization in spatial stats and environmental planning. And she also has a master's in urban and regional planning and, planning and a BA in biology and mathematics. Karis. Hello everyone, it's Karis with Spatial Informatics Group. At the beginning of this presentation, Todd shared an overview of the four challenges that need to be addressed in order to begin representing agroforestry systems in the measurement reporting and verification process in order to get countries results-based payments for their climate change uh, measures. One of these identified challenges was a gap. There is a need for a methodology to estimate the area of land currently in agroforestry systems. Simply stated, we need a tool that we can use to count the trees. A methodology that is already applied to quantify losses or gains in carbon biomass stocks associated with land cover and land use dynamics, such as deforestation, is a combination of area estimates of land use changes with carbon factors. In what follows, I will present the application of this approach using a free image viewing platform called Collectorif Online to estimate the area of land in agroforestry systems. This is the first step in assessing greenhouse gas losses and gains from agroforestry systems. Remy will then discuss his work determining carbon factors for the second step to complete the inventory. Before I describe our approach, I provide a brief overview of what many countries are already doing. Many have adopted the remote sensing supported area-based estimation approach to quantify land use dynamics, which impact greenhouse gas emissions. This involves the use of a statistical sample-based inventory. First, a probabilistic sample of plots are distributed across the reporting region. Then each of these plots are assigned land use or land and land cover labels, either through field work or the visual interpretation of high resolution imagery. Through the support of capacity building efforts, such as by Silver Carbon and FAO, many countries have completed these inventories using the free data viewing labeling platform called Collector Online or the desktop version to estimate the area of forest losses over their reporting time period. The use of Collector Online and the sample based approach adheres to the good guidance principles for use of remote sensing data in the measurement reporting and verification process. In what follows, I will describe how we adopted this accepted methodology to quantify the extent of trees in agroforestry. Before we can begin, though, we first need to determine what these systems look like in the aerial imagery, such as from a bird's eye view. If we take another look at the agroforestry slide that Todd presented earlier, you'll notice that these systems form pronounced patterns on the landscape. We posit we can take advantage of these patterns and the archive of historical high resolution imagery to inventory agroforestry systems. For example, here's a bird's eye view of boundary plantings. You can see it's quite easy to distinguish these, plant, these patterns in the imagery in the lower right hand corner. Here's another example of a mixed agrosilvicultural landscape. The patterns in this system are more subtle but still they are distinguishable to the trained eye, especially with local knowledge of common agroforestry practices already in place in the region. Now that we've briefly explored these patterns, next I'll discuss how we operationalize the area assessment using Collector of Online. Collector of Online is a fully operational satellite image viewing and interpretation system developed by Surveyor a joint NASA and USAID program in partnership with regional technical organizations around the world in the FAO. It promotes consistency in locating, interpreting, and labeling reference data plots for use in classifying and monitoring land cover and land use changes. The full functionality of Collector Earth Online, including a collaborative compilation of reference point databases, is implemented in the cloud, so there is no need for desktop installation. Nor is there a need to organize and compile data spreadsheets between multiple users. It is a free and open source platform, and the code base is shared through the Open Forest Initiative, maintained by the Food and Organ Agricultural Organization of the United Nations. 
The interface makes it easy for a project administrator set, to set up remote sensing based inventory projects. The project setup allows for on the fly probabilistic sample allocation or for the user to upload a predefined set of sample location. The plot design is customizable. Also, the survey note cards allow for flexible hierarchical design. Users can also define rules between incompatible land cover and land uses or other erroneous data entries, such as fractional land cover estimates that do not sum to 100% cover within the plot. After a project has been set up, the data collection can begin. Let's take a look at how the data collection process works using this example agroforestry data collection project in Vietnam. This plot is an example of a mixed agro-silvicultural plot. In the early stages, it is a rubber plantation. You can see as we scroll through the historic imagery in Google Earth that in 2012, there was mixed agriculture, agro-silviculture, with plantings in between the rows of the young rubber trees. Then as the plantation matured, it was a bit harder to detect the agro-silvicultural plantings. To label the plots, we select all of the samples and go down to the land use note card and select mixed agro-silviculture. There are other uh, questions on the note card, such as the overall land use and the previous land use. We use this information to analyze uh, and quantify the activity data within that study region. Here I present one example of one, a way to represent the distribution, spatial distribution of agroforestry systems. Here we have a sand key chart. It explores the amount of agroforestry practices present in each of the six IPCC land use and land cover classes for one uh, period of time. It's important to note that the Collector Earth Online platform is also fully integrated with another platform supported by FAO's Open Forest Initiative. This is called CEPL. CEPL includes a seamless approach to run the change in area estimates with or without creating land cover maps. And the result is a generation of the associated area, est of the est area estimates and associated confidence intervals. To quickly summarize our findings, uh, we found that developing countries that plan to use agroforestry to meet the climate and development goals need approaches that are affordable to measure, report, and verify their activities. In order to get payments for ecosystem services, we need to be able to count trees in agroforestry systems. We demonstrated the use of Collect Earth Online in Southeast Asia a free and open source platform that allows the assessment of agroforestry and land use patterns using available high resolution imagery and moderate resolution optical imagery, such as the Landsat data archive. The preliminary results show promise. The system is highly effective in identifying e easily distinguished types of agroforestry systems, such as agro-silvicultural, boundary planting, and home garden systems. However, as you noticed during the demonstration, some of these systems can be challenging to identify. Sometimes there are subtle landscape signatures, such as silvopastoral systems without contextual indicators, such as ranches. Also, some shadow systems are hard to identify depending on the plant heights. However, overall, we find the use of Collect Earth Online as a promising avenue to support MRB especially when the rich local knowledge of the regional experts are included in the photo interpretation process. We find it, can, it is a valuable tool to ensure that agroforestry trees get counted and count towards climate goals. This is 
allowing countries to move one step closer to meet financing requirements to get results-based payments for the use of these practices. Thanks. Thank you, Cars. Uh, up next, we'll have Remy Garnella. He's a soil scientist at CIRAD. He's currently based at the University of Zimbabwe. He holds a MSc in agronomy from AgroParisTech and a PhD in soil sciences from the University of Paris at Saclay. His research focuses on soil organic matter, nutrients, and root dynamics, climate change mitigation, adaptation, and food security in very, with various agroecological practices, including intercropping, conservation agriculture, and agroforestry. He's also heavily involved in research projects concerning the cat per mil or the four per thousand initiative uh, on soil carbon, the called Soils for Food Security and Climate. Hi everyone, it's Rémi Cardinal, research scientist from CIRAD. I'm very happy to present you this uh, work on the revision of uh, carbon stock change factors for agroforestry. So first of all, I would like to thank Todd for the invitation and also my colleague from FAO, Martial Bernou, with whom I prepared the slides. So as Todd explained in a previous talk, uh, the first critical step to report is to have a proper definition of what is agroforestry. And if you have a look at uh, what was uh, present in the previous IPCC guidelines, uh, agroforestry was actually part of a broader category. It was included into perennial crops. So this category uh, includes a very important diversity of systems, so like orchards, vineyards, plantations of uh, cocoa, coffee, oil pine, etc. So there was no specific category for agroforestry system. Then the second step is to have a default coefficient. So in the previous IPCC guidelines, uh, if you look at table 5.1, there was some default coefficient for above ground uh, woody biomass uh, in different climate regions, so in temperate, tropical dry, moist, and wet. And here you have some uh, default uh, coefficient for above ground biomass accumulation rates. And you also can see that there was a huge error that was associated, so plus or minus 75%. And this error was the same for all the climate regions because uh, it was just by default. There was no, no real estimate of the incertitude. So it's the same in uh, table 5.2. Um, the potential carbon storage for agroforestry system was provided in different uh, eco-region of the world. So here you have some, some estimates for uh, agro-civiculture and for silvopasture in different uh, eco-regions. Uh, but again, with uh, only a, a few, a few specific, uh, a few, a few data in a few regions and uh, with a very important uh, variation. So concerning the below ground biomass, there was no data provided in the IPCC guidelines. So the default assumption is that there, there is no change in below ground biomass of perennial trees planted in agroforestry, in agricultural systems. Sorry. And then concerning the soil organic carbon, um, IPCC used um, a stock change factor, so here FLU. Um, so basically this, uh, this FLU is the ratio of the soil organic carbon stocks in agroforestry compared to the soil organic carbon stock in the reference. So it can be in the cropland or in the grassland or in the forest. And the default assumption was that uh, this ratio is equal to, to one. So it means that um, there is no change in the soil organic carbon stock following the conversion of uh, land use to an agroforestry system. So to summarize, uh, currently uh, the agroforestry in the IPCC guidelines was not very well represented. Uh, concerning the above ground biomass, there, was, there were only a, a few non-specific data. Uh, for the below ground biomass, no data was provided. And for soil organic carbon, uh, the assumption was that 
there is no change. So there was a clear need to have more refined data. So what we did is a, a review of a coefficient for soil organic and biomass carbon storage in agroforestry system. So we use the same typology for these two uh, variables, and uh, we use uh, we use the climate classification that was provided by uh, the IPCC. So we defined eight uh, types of agroforestry system. So you you can see here on on the left. Um, so it's a very common classification for uh, agroforestry system, and we gather 122 uh, relevant scientific peer-reviewed uh, papers, and in total we got 542 observations, so 324 for uh, biomass carbon storage and 218 for soil organic carbon storage. So you can see also on, on, the, on the map that uh, we have data quite everywhere with a few exceptions, uh, especially in North Africa, uh, in Southwest Africa, in Australia, and also in uh, South uh, America. So let's have a look at one of the results. Um, so on the left, you have the soil organic carbon storage or loss rate uh, as a function of different land use change. So or plant to agroforestry system or grassland to agroforestry system. And on the, on the right, it's basically the same, except that we use the stock change factor that is used by IPCC. So we can directly see that the default coefficient of one that is used by the previous guidelines is obviously wrong because uh, if you have a conversion of a crop land to an agroforestry system, then you will increase the soil organic carbon stock. And on the opposite uh, conversion of a forest to an agroforestry system, you will uh, decrease this stock. So we used this uh, review to update the agroforestry default in the 2019 refinement of the 2006 IPCC guidelines. So we used, as I explained before, this uh, classification of agroforestry system. So we have eight main types of agroforestry systems. So here you, you can see uh, the different tables that were present in the 2006 guidelines for uh, above ground um, biomass and growth rates. And now the tables uh, in 2019, so basically we have the same table, but all of them have been updated. So this uh, refinement to the 2006 uh, guidelines have been ad adopted on the 12th of May, so ve very recently in Japan. So now um, you can see here the, the big difference. In 2006, we had only a few non-specific data for agroforestry. And now we have all these tables. So we have data for different climate and uh, regions, for different agroforestry systems. And for soil organic carbon, we even have this coefficient uh, as a function of the land use change. So now it's possible to have a better recognition uh, of agroforestry in national inventories, but also in uh, NDCs or in any project uh, implemented. So also these coefficients have been submitted to the emission factor database of the IPCC, so they will be accessible to everyone. Every country who would like to report on uh, agroforestry will use this, uh, this default coefficient. And obviously, it's uh, just the first step that was based on uh, peer-reviewed papers. But this coefficient could be, again, refined, especially using data from uh, the gray literature. And now the next step also is to incorporate these coefficients into carbon calculators. So this is currently the case with the uh, Exante Carbon Balance Tool, which is developed by FAO. So this tool uh, is able to, to estimate uh, the impact of a uh, development project on the uh, net balance of uh, greenhouse gases emissions. And now the developing uh, team is um, creating a module on agroforestry using this coefficient. So now it, it will be possible to 
to evaluate the impact of an agroforestry project in, um, on greenhouse gases emissions. So many thanks for your attention and I uh, will be very happy to answer your questions. Thank you. Thanks, Remy. Uh, up next, we will have Marta Suber. Uh, Marta holds an MSc on Environmental Policies and Management of Tropical Forests and is part of the ICRAF team based in Lima, Peru. She focuses on greenhouse gas inventories, carbon financed agriculture, forestry, and other land use projects and certification schemes. Her work includes research on smallholders, farmers' potential to address climate change, uh, AFALU national policies, and strategies for emissions reductions. Martin. Good morning, my name is Marta Suber from ICRAF Latin America. Today we are going to look together at the process of overcoming reporting barriers for silvopasture system mitigation uh, contribution that has been looked at on uh, national uh, regional scale. Sorry. In the 90s in Latin America, most of the deforested land became pasture for extensive grazing, and during the last 50 years, emission has almost doubled, converting the region into the first emitter uh, in the Latin sector. Many countries have already recognized the, the, this practice as fundamental to reduce uh, emissions and uh, started to implement those systems for mitigation. Others have started processes of designing or implementation of NAMAS that are nationally appropriate mitigation action, as the case for Colombia and Peru, but also implementing, for example, in Nicaragua, in Costa Rica, I'm sorry. Nevertheless, uh, the role is recognized, the important role of the industrial system has been recognized. Just two countries are actually explicitly including those systems in the national level. Brazil and Uruguay, so there is still a lot to do and a lot to go to make the system recognize what they are worth in, in terms of mitigation. So we have seen how agroforestry can actually bring in a lot of environmental services into the pastoral system as part of it are not less of it. Um, there, as we have seen, they are used to increase the productivity to reduce the pressure on forests, but um, uh, especially because uh, the 46% of the livestock sector emissions are still generated by land use change activities. There are several constraints of different nature that um, uh, exist in uh, in recognizing those systems and, and accounting them within the national inventories of uh, therefore has climate action. We have, for example, a lack of technical knowledge or a lack of activity data and emission factors that can prevent um, estimating uh, within um, categories of the IPCC if those systems correctly. We have seen as well that um, agroforestry in general is not so visible in uh, inventories. But now that a change is finally possible and can be foreseen thanks to the recent publication of the colleagues. But we have been working on an extensive network of countries in Latin America, 18 to be precise, nine of which has uh, actively participated in. Uh, looking at the definition of uh, silvopastoral systems and the land use categorization of those systems. We have also been looking at which are the requirements for having the system including, included in the monitoring, reporting and verification systems uh, in place in each country and which are the purposes of these MRV systems regarding silvopastoral systems and um, as well as the availability of uh, activity partners. We finalized the work looking at which are the successful stories in the region. And I've included here for your use uh, the link to the report. Unfortunately, it's only available in Spanish. So this, um, this network has uh, actually worked together uh, through webinars and online workshop and uh, uh, as well in the, in the writing of the report uh, by bringing together more than uh, 30 key stakeholders of the sector. We had uh, public sector representatives, we had uh, the National Federation of uh, Livestock of Colombia, several national and international centers, 
from all through the region. We had Pau from Ecuador, where it's actually working, and um, and uh, UNEP DTU that uh, supported uh, Honduras and Nicaragua NAMA design. And finally, but not least, we had the Red in J, which is the network, uh, regional network for um, national inventories on GNG, and includes all uh, national focal points of those countries that are 12 at the moment. We have, been, <coughs> sorry, we have been building together a decision-making tree to guide countries in understanding the relevance of uh, having or not having civil pastoral system reported. And um, in fact, we have brought uh, knowledge to them and understanding uh, to them by building those, those, uh, this sequence of first steps um, that um, leads to have silver pastoral system uh, included in the national MRV system. Um, this decision making tree is actually also indicating what is required from for passing from a certain level of accuracy, let's say to tier one, to a tier two, and then eventually to a tier three, both in case of uh, emission factors and activity data. Finally, we elaborate all together a roadmap, which uh, a short, medium term roadmap to make the invest. Um, we have seen that many countries are still lacking uh, legal civil pastoral system definition, and so therefore it is proposed to work jointly at the regional scale on a common ecosystem based definition that is also valid for climate change. We have seen how this definition could actually imply uh, some um, problems in, in other schemes that have already been set up in countries as the Red Plus. And um, for example, for a practical case, for example, the civil pastoral system that are uh, currently uh, happening or putting in place, put in place into forests, and, uh, and how this uh, definition could alter eventually some of those uh, agreements already taken under different uh, uh, schemes. So new and uh, common guidelines are necessary for those systems that uh, are broad enough to include not only the climate change component itself or MRV, but also uh, other processes already happening in countries. And finally, a general lack of uh, basic information for estimating the um, system that uh, can be um, enhanced through the work that the Red NJ is already doing uh, through the region and through local initiatives that are working on establishing or enforcing um, capacities for uh, data generation within subnational and national levels, but in some cases also through countries. Of course, it, is, uh, it has been considered and very well uh, received the news that um, we have now new IPCC values for agroforestry and now including also simple pastoral systems. So there is uh, a new line of work that uh, these articles of Remy and colleagues uh, open in the region. Thank you very much. So finalize here two successful stories that this report and the work has uh, generated. One is in Costa Rica. Um, during a high-level workshop of uh, the land cover and land use and ecosystem monitoring systems, for which it has uh, one of the contribution has been uh, the report itself and the descriptor, and uh, that can be actually being used for the Lama uh, the lives of Lama, and those principles that we have outlined in the also applies to agroforestry more broadly and can be exported to the coffee Nama too. And finally, an activity that is. Uh, right now starting um, in Colombia, Panama and Peru that is want to um, analyze and view what the information available is, which is its quality and what are the methodology that uh, already are um, in place or what could be, put, what could be put in place by each of those companies for generating activity data on civil pastoral systems. Thank you very much. This is the last slide where you can find my contacts. Please do not doubt in contacting me if you have any other questions. Thank you very much. Bye.
Thank you, Marta, and thank you to all the presenters. My name is Juliana White. I'm with the CGR Research Program on Climate Change, Agriculture, and Food Security and based at the University of Vermont. I'm going to um, facilitate the question and answer period. Um, so we have already received some questions. You can send your questions via the GoToWebinar question button, and I will read them out, and um, our presenters today will answer them. Uh, we have a few questions that have come in already. Uh, Nancy Cadenia asks, um, is there any protocol for planting trees and grass? And I think, Mark, I'll read three questions now. So Marta, if you can answer, is there any protocol for planting trees and grass? Sudita from Thailand asks, could the countries without AFALU planning in NDCs implement agroforestry carbon project? So Todd, if you could take that one. Countries without AFALU planning and NDCs implementing agroforestry carbon projects. And the third question also from Sutita is for, I think Remy will take this one. As a high cost for soil organic carbon assessed, assessment is in place, how many years should we do a soil organic carbon assessment for an agroforestry carbon project? Okay, um, let's see, Marta, would you like to start? Yes, of course. Um, thanks, Nancy, for your question. There are actually no protocols so far um, in place. What there is is actually a um, minimum list of requirements on which each country, when uh, in, interested in reporting on grass, for example, should comply with to, to comply actually with the methodology that it's current in place, and I'm referring to 2060 IPCC methodology. Um, through the work we conducted here in Latin America, we managed to actually analyze what are those requirements, and of course they include not only knowing uh, the grass component, and in the case of silvopastoral systems, you only also need um, of course, information on species, on tree species, and tree densities, and etc., etc., etc. So there is no actual protocol recognized as such, but there is a minimum requiring requirement list. Thank you, Marta. Todd. Sure. Thank you for the question. Um, of course, there's many different types of programs and projects that, besides the, NDC, the framework put forward by NDCs where agroforestry is relevant. And just to name one other one uh, real quickly would be around the bond challenge in land restoration. Um, and then even within the climate window, there's any number of mechanisms such as the nationally appropriate mitigation actions and, and forest restoration actions, et cetera, that where agroforestry is also relevant. So I wouldn't hold um, where at, hold countries or where countries are do not have are not reporting on AFLU doesn't mean that agroforestry isn't relevant for their uh, climate and, and social goals. Thank you. Thank you, Todd. Remy, would you be able to answer your question? Yes. So it's not an easy one. I think it was concerning uh, the, um, the duration of uh, how many years will it take to see a difference in uh, soil organic carbon stocks. So uh, yes, if you are only look, looking at soil organic carbon stock, it, 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 can take, uh, it, it can take 10 years maybe to see uh, a difference in the soil organic carbon stock, but it, it will also depend, for example, on the, on the tree density. But uh, you can still uh, see some early changes of uh, these soil organic carbon stocks, like uh, if you're looking at uh, particulate organic matter, at soil fractions, even at uh, enzyme activities or uh, pox carbon. But it's true that uh, to monitor soil organic carbon, it takes time. And uh, that's one of the challenge of uh, MRV in uh, soil organic carbon stocks. Thank you, uh, Remy. So I'm going to take another set of three questions. This comes, um, is there any UNFCCC standard protocol to estimate carbon sequestration potential of an agroforestry system? Um, so let's see, Todd or Remy, you can take that one. The next question is, how can we use agroforestry projects to quantify and sell carbon credits? Carbon credits could be a way to secure funding for re reforestry in desolated areas such as Haiti. 
So how could we use agroforestry projects to quantify and sell carbon credits? Uh, let's have Marta answer that one. And the last one, um, how is impermanence dealt with, considering that agroforestry is quick rotation and you can just not bother to replant? So um, um, Todd, maybe you can tell us who should take that last question. So let's go, let's go ahead and start with the um, UNF triple C standard protocol to estimate carbon sequestration potential. Um, Remy, do you want to take that? Or Todd? Uh, yeah, I've, I, actually, there is no, there is no protocol uh, provided by the IPCC on how to measure uh, soil organic carbon sequestration. And, and I think that's, uh, that's a problem, but maybe Todd has a different answer. <laughs> Yeah, the, the, the standard protocols being put out for quantification of greenhouse gas emissions uh, are being put out by the IPCC, good good practice guidelines. Um, these are the types of activities that Remy and colleagues have been updating uh, with with the the numbers. So it's essentially it goes through step by step the kinds of, kinds of protocols that uh, and the kinds of measurements that are needed uh, at the different tiers. Um, if I'm understanding the question correctly. Thanks, both of you. So, Marta, would you be able to answer about how agroforestry projects can be used to quantify and soil car and sell carbon credits, especially in the case of securing funding for reforestry? Sure. Um, well, in fact, uh, agroforestry projects are already quantifying and selling carbon credits. Uh, if we look, for example, at the voluntary market, we can see that several um, projects worldwide are already including the agroforestry component within the project activities. It has to be said that uh, it is quite hard to see um, projects, it's quite difficult, I would say, to see projects that are actually including agroforestry system that has been established previously of the project coming in the area. So it's it's still a way to, get the easy way taken so far. And we, we are working on that here in Peru, especially because we saw that we have no knowledge uh, enough in general on agroforestry um, sequestration, for example, for many areas, and those projects themselves are a source of uh, in information that is quite important, especially because the methodology they are applying and they are request to apply to actually um, quantify and then verify the carbon estimations are uh, quite tight <laughs> and, and strict. So um, in, in fact, agroforestry projects are a, a good source of information, but at the same time, um, they are limiting their um, activities um, to, to, to agroforestry system they are establishing from zero. So it is kind of, um, let's say first uh, effort and intent to and, and possibility to use those those projects as um, information and then and then for, for, for the national level let's say but uh, it is still incomplete um, I'm not sure if I answer properly the question but I think it is it is a, an, an open possibility and it's something that is happening so we really should see how to improve what what we have in place. Thank you, Marta. Okay, um, the next two questions are, is AFALU the right system for taking into consideration both livestock and agroforestry systems? And the second question is, how do you address the adverse effects of large agroforestry projects at community level and also to reduce leakage? So that's, that's a packed question. So, um, Todd, maybe you can help us. Who should answer, is AFALU the right system for taking into consideration both livestock and agroforestry systems? Marta, would you like to take this one? <laughs> yes, I think um, I'm qualified because we, we have been discussing quite extensively on that with all the colleagues of the network. And, um, and in some cases, uh, colleagues from more advanced countries has been struggling uh, in uh, within their follow system because they say that um, whatever implementation we have a silver pasture system, for example, is going to be accounted on, on the land base um, 
let's say, on, on, on the forest and trees component only and not as an effort of the livestock uh, sector itself. Uh, so they are quite complaining about that. Actually, I follow it is the right system and, and the right space to, um, to have in both uh, livestock and agroforestry accounted for. The problem, and, and it's not, uh, an uns it is still un unsolved, but it says not, um, but it's not a limitation, is uh, the interface between those two, two subsectors um, of a follow. So, um, should we consider the, comp the animal component separately from, uh, for example, the tree component when we are discussing our silvopastoral systems? Um, yes and no, because we have um, a kind of feedbacks between the two on productivity, for example, on emission reduction. Uh, we can have uh, improved uh, grasslands together with a silvopastoral system that has a direct impact on uh, emissions from livestock that are normally accounted into the livestock sub sub uh, sub classification. So um, I think we need well, going back to the presentation, we need a definition what, for what silvopastoral system really represents and therefore we can uh, include both components at the same time under this definition and then probably clarify a bit more on how to report on both um, subcategories. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marta. Um, Karis, we have a few questions about um, baselines. Um, and, and so we're going to ask um, you to answer both of those. So if we need to implement a carbon project, what is the baseline for an agroforestry project? Um, let's start with that and then I'll, read, I'll follow up if we have time. So the baseline for an agroforestry project. Hi. Um, so I, I'll maybe let others chime in too. Um, a baseline for agroforestry to monitor and collect earth online would depend on the use of uh, or on the availability of high resolution imagery. Um, we have in collect earth online, we have access to the historic archive of digital globe and um, we have the ability to plug in a key for planet data so we can go back in time. Um, the data for high high resolution imagery is pretty decent in Google Earth, um, but it's definitely a it the availability of data varies by region, so you'd have to look into that um, in terms of using Collect Earth Online for um, agroforestry MRV. Um, at the same time. You can make some inferences using optical imagery from Landsat. It's just a coarser resolution. So um, it's definitely, Collect Earth Online is definitely a tool to use for moving forward with monitoring changes in the, more in the current, um, current time frame. But I think you can, you can customize it as long as you make your uh, limitations clear with what you're monitoring if you go back in time to like the year 2000 or back to before that. Thank you. Thank you, Karis. I, I think you did answer the question. We'll just take one last question. And that is, um, and, and that we're going to send to Todd, and it is how to address the adverse effects of large agroforestry projects at the community level and how to reduce leakage. Todd? Thanks. Uh, well, at Craft, we're always advocating for community participation in project development. And so uh, the, the best way to address adverse effects and un, unintended consequences to have the appropriate people involved in project design and implementation. And so this is, this is how we go about that within Craft. Thank you. Great, thanks, Todd. So um, I'd like to take a minute to thank all the presenters and to everyone listening in. Um, we will share, um, to everyone who registered for the webinar, we will share the presentations and the video. And, um, and the presenters um, happily put in their contact information so you can be in contact. We'd also like to thank um, 
USAID, um, CGI, our colleagues, and all the partners who are participating in this webinar, webinar series. The next net webinar will take place on July 10th at the same time, which is 9 a.m. Eastern time. The topic is, can we reduce greenhouse gas emissions from livestock? They'll go over a feasibility and investment study from East Africa featuring Polly Erickson and, and Todd Crane from ILRI and Lini Wollenberg from CCAS and the University of Vermont. Thank you, everyone. Goodbye.